Hey there, and welcome back to my Beast Machines Retrospective. This is part two, so if you haven't seen it yet, or you'd like a refresher, you can check out part one right here. Last time we covered the show's background, its central themes, animation, and character designs. Now though, we finally move on to what seems to me to be the most polarizing aspect of Beast Machines, its characters. I know I said in part one in regards to Beast Machines and its relationship with Beast Wars that different doesn't necessarily mean worse, and I stand by that statement. When it comes to returning cast members, however, I wish more of an effort had been put into making sure their characteristics, personalities, motivations, etc. remained consistent. Some problems aren't that Simple. Obviously, in any form of fiction, character development is necessary. You need it to keep people interested over a long story. For certain characters, that also means a more drastic shift may occur at some point. But Beast Machines radically changes aspects of every single returning character from Beast Wars right out of the gate and never looks back. So much of Beast Machines' cast is controversial in some way that it'll really just be easier to talk first about the only member who isn't. Cheetor is awesome. So awesome that Hasbro decided to put his face on the packaging of almost every Beast Machines product at the beginning of the line, and gave him by far the biggest toy in the series. Oh, he's huge as a cat! Cheetor is the only returning Beast Wars character that I think I kind of prefer on Beast Machines. He's now second in command of the Maximals, having graduated from being the kid last time around, and his opinions frequently clash with some of Optimus's more questionable decision making. What did you get us into, Big Bot? Cheetor is presented as a more clear headed voice of reason than Primal, even relieving him from command on occasion. The end of Beast Machines also seems to imply that Cheetor inherits the ability to commune with the Oracle from Optimus. Speaking of the boss monkey, despite having been the Maximals' commander throughout three seasons of Beast Wars, Optimus Primal was probably the least developed character to survive through to the end of that series. It's not that he was badly written or anything, he was just a bit more straightforward and down-to-earth than most of the cast. Optimus didn't need a bunch of episodes devoted to exploring him because you got a pretty good sense of him without all of that. He starts off Beast Wars as the commander of an inexperienced team who finds himself in charge of a much more dangerous and important situation than he was equipped to deal with. Primal did the best he could with the people he had, got better at the job over time, and ultimately settled into the military leader role, becoming a total badass by the show's third season. He also served as a father figure to the team, especially to Cheetor. Yeah, Optimus! In Beast Machines, Optimus Primal's character becomes more of a spiritual leader than a military one, focusing on his struggle to interpret and carry out the will of the Oracle after it leads him to be reformatted, with the military leadership role largely shifting to Cheetor. I'm not a big fan of the way this show turns Primal into a zealot who ultimately becomes a martyr to his cause, a cause which, as we discussed last time, I don't know if I'm totally behind. We're on a higher plane of existence. I have attained it by communing with the Oracle. To be fair though, most of the other Maximals also seem to think he's kind of nuts, and the show does explore the negative consequences of his fanaticism through this really cool standoff between he and Megatron in the first season finale that functions as a metaphor for mutually assured destruction. So I guess it's okay. He does get a lot better in season two, and I'll admit these developments do make Primal a more fleshed out character here than he was on Beast Wars, I just don't like him as much anymore. He started going a little mystical. And I really wasn't too keen on that. Rat Trap also gets a big downgrade in Beast Machines. On the previous series, Rat Trap was one of the most resourceful and cunning characters, an expert of special weaponry and espionage. Here he's repurposed as a purely support character, equipped with no weapons whose primary utilities are now hacking into computers and picking locks with his tail, as well as managing the Maximals R&D, though he's pretty bad at that. He also whines. A lot. I am getting really chased off here! Rat Trap. Rat Trap was always a bit whiny on Beast Wars, but Beast Machines takes it to a new extreme. He spends a lot of his screen time complaining about one thing or another, especially near the beginning of the series. This culminates in the sixth episode, The Weak Component, which in my opinion is the worst episode of Beast Machines. After being ridiculed by the rest of the Maximals for being useless in combat, Rat Trap betrays the team, striking a deal with Megatron to protect the Tyrant from the other Maximals in exchange for a powerful exosuit. The episode concludes with both characters staying true to their word. Rat Trap protects Megatron until dawn, and Megatron lets the Maximals retreat unharmed. Both have the opportunity in this episode to win the day for their respective sides, but neither one does. Rat Trap even chooses to leave the exosuit behind. On Beast Wars, Rat Trap and Megatron were both pragmatic to a fault, and neither one of them would have hesitated for a second to screw the other one over in this sort of situation. Megatron in particular would have never let his honor get in the way of an easy victory. You dare use the H-word to me. 
This episode is the low point for Rat Trap's character, though. He does improve from then on. While I still vastly preferred Rat Trap in Beast Wars, I got this comment on a previous video which put his Beast Machines character arc in a completely new perspective for me, and as a result, Rat Trap did end up growing on me in Beast Machines. I can appreciate that the show's writers were trying new things for Transformers by turning one of the main characters into a non-combatant, even though I personally disagree with that direction for Rat Trap. His R2-D2 tale is kind of cool, though, and I also really love Loved this one nod that we get to Dinobot. Watch your mouth, Junior! I lost friends in that war! After being one of the standout characters of Beast Wars Season 3, I feel like Black Arachnia struggles to find her place in the cast now that she's firmly a part of the Maximal crew. Her former Predacon allegiance, a large part of what made her interesting last time around, is never directly mentioned in Beast Machines. In fact, pretty much her only defining trait throughout most of the show is that she really, really wants Silverbolt back. But then once she brings him back in Season 2, her story becomes mostly centered around how her boyfriend has started ignoring her and listening to too much Linkin Park. I was a fool back then. I believed in things. Silverbolt gets one scene early on in the series where, for a brief moment, it feels like he's gonna come back unchanged from how he was before. The dialogue in this scene between Silverbolt, Waspinator, and Black Arachnia is some of the best in the series. You have to control your drones! Drones? The banter feels reminiscent of classic Beast Wars. However, as I said, this is a one-off. By the time Silverbolt gets around to actually joining the cast, he's become inexplicably dour in temperament due to guilt over his actions while he was Jetstorm. This guilt doesn't seem to be a problem the first time he showed up, and it doesn't really make logical sense for him to feel guilty. He was a different person, after all. It's never quite explained how exactly Megatron changes the personality and memories of the sparks he reuses, but I imagine it's similar to Tarantulas' Predacon shell program from Beast Wars. And hey, Silverbolt's always been a sentimental fellow, so I suppose I get that he'd be pretty upset. I also get that what they're going for here is like a role reversal thing, where instead of Silverbolt trying to convince Black Arachnia to join the Maximals, it's Black Arachnia trying to convince Silverbolt. It's just that this change to Silverbolt's personality sucks absolutely all of the fun out of the character, who had previously been depicted as a cornball paladin hero type. Strong, proud, brave. Even smart as a sack of hammers. Unhand her, reptilian filth! Words! Nothing more than air. I believe. He's also got this thing now where he keeps undermining Cheetor's authority by treating him like the kid he was back on Earth. If you want to follow this kid to the scrap heap, that's your business. Dude, shut up. You're younger than he is. I don't take orders from children. Track and identify. We will get on it immediately, Cheetor. The only new Maximal for most of the series, Night Scream, is considered annoying by a lot of fans, but I don't find that to be the case very often. Having survived on his own in the depths of Cybertron's underground before finding the other Maximals, Night Scream starts off as a bit of a loner, but gradually warms to the rest of the team. I do think it's a bit of a funny detail that Night Scream has no idea at first why anybody is listening to Optimus. I'm just saying that until he's all better, maybe somebody else ought to take over. Look at him! He's in no condition to leave. I'm telling you, he's gonna get us blown to kingdom come! Night Scream never knew him before, and he thinks their simian leader is monkeying around too much with the Oracle. Pun somewhat intended. Night Scream also develops a close bond with the double beast moded creature Savage Noble, seeing him as a fellow outcast and survivor. The final Maximal introduced, Botanica, is an interesting character in concept, though she joins the series a bit late and doesn't get much characterization. Botanica is a Transformer who returns to Cybertron from a scientific mission to Planet Jungle from Shadow Raiders, where she took a plant based alternate form rather than an animal or vehicle. Despite being one of the most powerful Maximals, Botanica is a pacifist, and she usually stays behind from battles to tend to the techno-organic garden. She also begins to develop a romantic relationship with Rat Trap right at the very end of the series. So I'm a tree hugger. Deal with it! Their relationship never rises above the standard first they hate each other, then they fall in love trope you see in a lot of romantic comedies, and it doesn't do much to advance either of their characters, it just sort of happens. Interestingly, Botanica is the only main cast member of either Beast Machines or Beast Wars who never got an associated toy from Hasbro and Takara, despite the character's inclusion in the series originally being a suggestion by Hasbro. As for villains, we've got mostly new characters recycled from old ones. The first three Viacon 
generals all have sparks reused from Beast Wars characters and are created by Megatron to combat the Techno-Organic Maximals. None of them are ever given much depth as characters in their own right, but each has enough of a personality that they never get boring to watch. I particularly liked Jetstorm, played by Brian Drummond. It's over 9,000! Jetstorm is the most upbeat character in the series, providing some much-needed levity to a lot of scenes. Hey, like it, one maximal, do we hear two, two, two maximal, two, two maximal, so to the handsome devil with the silver wings, me! <laughs> An excitable jet plane prone to outbursts who eventually gets reformatted back into Silverbolt, who, as we've already discussed, is far less entertaining. What do you know about my spirit? Then there's Thrust, a motorcycle who thinks he's too cool for everyone else and actually flips the Maximals off twice during Beast Machines, once at Optimus Primal and once at Cheetor. Order this, Maximal! Thrust was created using the spark of Waspinator, who on the one hand gets his happy ending from Beast Wars taken away, but on the other hand actually enjoys being Thrust. Waspinator, cool, biker bot. <sighs> Although I did find that once his identity as Waspinator is revealed, Thrust gradually becomes more and more of the Viacon's butt monkey throughout the rest of the series. Finally, we have Tankor, a tank bot of limited intelligence, amusingly made from the spark of Rhinox, the former Maximal Triple Threat who, back on Beast Wars, was not only the team's brain and brawn, but also their most spiritual character. An unbelievably badass bot who somehow never managed to get a major story arc to himself until now. Well done, old friend. Steady nerves and quick thinking comes with a job description. No, I'm serious. If you ever wanted to, you'd make one prime leader. Ah, poor Rhinox. He got the shaft in Beast Wars Season 3, and now he's taking the shaft in Beast Machines. Once Rhinox's consciousness and memories are awakened within Tankor, rather than joining his old friends, Rhinox makes the decision to go off alone and become a third-party bad guy, working against both Megatron and Optimus Primal. Megatron was right, but when he failed to eliminate you, I will succeed! This development is a pretty big slap in the face to the original character, who I don't think it'd be much of a stretch to describe on Beast Wars as Primal's most stalwart companion. This was a guy who, when Optimus died, went spelunking through the space-time continuum to literally fish his friend's soul back out from the other side and drop it into a new body. And now he's just decided he'd rather be evil because... Evil is cooler, I guess. With all of that said, though, I honestly do think I prefer Rhinox's mishandling in Beast Machines over his almost total absence from Beast Wars Season 3. At least here he gets to be a badass again, even if it is as a villain. There was an episode all the way back in Season 1 of Beast Wars where Rhinox is reprogrammed as a Predacon but nearly ends up overthrowing Megatron as the leader, and there is a certain amount of satisfaction seeing that version of the character kind of come to fruition on Beast Machines, even if it is at the cost of one of my favorite characters characters from the previous series. Now, in the cases of Optimus Primal, Cheetor, Rat Trap, Black Arachnea, Silverbolt, and Rhinox, the shift in characterization can be attributed to character development. Whether or not you think it's good development that makes sense for or honors the spirit of the character is irrelevant. Character development is a valid excuse for all of those changes. There is, however, absolutely no excuse for Megatron, who in Beast Machines is just a completely different guy for no satisfactory reason that I can come up with. Megatron's quirky personality was his most endearing quality on Beast Wars. He had all of these funny little habits, most famously his overuse of the word yes. Yes, yes, yes. All of this while still managing to be an intimidating villain most of the time, just in how unhinged he could get. You never knew exactly what crazy lengths he would go to next to accomplish his goals. In Beast Machines, Megatron has been reduced to a more generic villain. Destroy the Maximals! Destroy them all! He's still very effective, menacing, intimidating, and suitably evil, and the voice work by David Kay is still superb. I just find the character far less interesting this time around, and like the rest of the series, way less fun. You could sense it, like, oh, no fun anymore? Oh, geez, no more pull my finger? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, it, it changed. Some of us liked it, some of us didn't. All the characters, all they were doing was sniping at each other all the time, all the time. And it just got to be almost like a like a divorce. It started falling apart. Enough! We were told, I believe, at one time, Megatron is, you know, he's he's evil. You know, he's dark. He is no rubber ducky anymore. And I, I missed that. Personally. His goal in Beast Machines is to absorb the sparks of every living Transformer into one, ruling over Cybertron as its only sentient being. The only way to achieve true unity is through a singular mind. Till all are one! 
I don't know, though. I think Beast Wars Megatron would have disliked the prospect of being the last man on Earth. Most of the time when Megatron was doing something particularly diabolical, he was very theatrical about it and usually had someone else in the room to bounce off of. Yeah, me Megatron. He even opened a video chat with Optimus Primal so he could gloat and laugh in his face before killing him. Given absolute power over Cybertron, I'd picture Megatron plastering his face all over the planet and forcing its denizens to watch as he soliloquizes about what a genius he is and how the Predacons will take their rightful place as galactic overlords, but the only thing Beast Machine's Megatron ever talks about is how he wants to purge Cybertron of all organic life, including his own beast mode, which he now inexplicably hates. Throughout Beast Machine's first season, Megatron conducts several experiments on himself in an attempt to rid his body of its beast mode. In Season 2, this ultimately results in his beast elements being excised into the fully organic creature Savage Noble, who has two beast modes but no robot mode. There was never any indication whatsoever on Beast Wars that Megatron had a problem with his or anyone else's beast modes. We will create alternate forms based on the most powerful local creatures. In fact, he seemed quite in touch with his dino side and could sometimes be seen petting his T-Rex head or brushing its teeth. Once he became a Transmetal 2 and his beast mode changes from a T-Rex to Dragon, Megatron is completely enamored with the idea, referring to himself multiple times in the third person as the Dragon, like a Targaryen on Game of Thrones. Enter the Dragon! Beware! The Dragon's wrath! After a bit of a body shuffle, Megatron eventually becomes a completely digital being, depicted through most of Beast Machine's second season as a floating holographic face, while Noble ends up joining the Maximals. Towards the very end of the series, Megatron appears to revert a bit to his more vibrant Beast Wars persona, but by then it's too little too late. Yes. If these changes had been made to just one or two of the original cast, then I think there would have been a lot less ill will towards the show. Most of their character arcs are contextually justifiable after all. It's the fact that we're talking about every character here that makes the changes come off as disrespectful. Oh geez, I almost forgot. There's also these two other Viacon characters, Obsidian and Stryka, who get introduced near the end of the series. These two are apparently legendary military Transformers who Megatron recruits to his cause after the loss of Jetstorm and Tankor. The show spends a lot of time hyping them up at first, but like Botanica, they aren't around for very long and didn't leave a strong impression on me. These two are supposedly the only two Viacons that Megatron didn't reprogram at all and are only helping in his cause for the sake of Cybertron's greater good. This feeds into the clash of the uniform and collectivist Viacons against the unique and individualistic Maximals, but not much is really explored on that front and it kinda just gets shuffled off. Obsidian and Stryka are the only characters on Beast Machines who feel to me like they're really only around to sell more toys. Speaking of the toys, if you've seen my Beast Wars videos, you may be wondering why I've barely mentioned the toys this time around, despite their being such a large part of the narrative previously. This is because the Beast Wars toy line heavily influenced decisions made on the accompanying television show, often in glaringly obvious ways, which made it relevant to talk about at various junctures of that retrospective. However, as with so many other aspects of Beast Machines, Hasbro decided to take a different approach this time. The toy line and the show's character roster and designs were developed independently, following initial concept sketches and meetings from early on in the process. This resulted in many of the toys bearing little resemblance to their their TV counterparts, which in turn led to several new figures being produced for many of Beast Machine's cast, generally becoming more show accurate as they went. Like the show's character designs, Beast Machine's toys were a departure from what fans had come to expect from the franchise, and sales were far outperformed by the new Car Robots line, which were all available in Japan around the same time as Beast Machine's was in the West. Many adult and teenage Western Transformers fans even began to import those toys from overseas rather than buy what Beast Machine's had to offer. Offer. Hasbro ended Beast Machines in 2000, choosing not to renew the show for a third season and even cancelling the last few toys that were currently in development. The end of Beast Machines marked not only the end of Transformers Beast Era, which was by now comprised of four television shows, it was also the last Transformers series to be animated by Mainframe Entertainment, as well as the final entry in Transformers G1 continuity on television, which began all the way back in 1984. Every iteration of Transformers on TV since then have taken place in diverse 
divergent timelines. Except, of course, in Japan, where everything is supposed to be connected and it just doesn't make any sense. Unlike the Beast era shows, which are notable for having shaken up the formula, these future iterations have all been variations on the original Transformers concept, where the Autobots and Decepticons, led by Optimus Prime and Megatron respectively, fight each other on present-day Earth. Beast Machines was originally planned to be followed up by another sequel called Transformers Transtech. Transtech would have continued Hasbro's relationship with Mainframe, and would have combined the four previous Transformer factions into two. It was also planned to bring back many G1 characters, such as the original Optimus Prime, Truck, not Monkey, as well as Megatron, Starscream, and Shockwave, among others, mixed in with returning Beast Machines characters Cheetor, Black Arachnia, Night Scream, and Silverbolt, as well as bringing back Depth Charge, who had died on Beast Wars. Unfortunately, Transtech was scrapped early in development. This concept art and a few prototype toys are all that was ever produced. Increased competition from the growing anime and video game industries in the early 2000s, particularly from big up-and-comer Pokémon, caused Hasbro and Takara to step back and reassess their next move for the Transformers franchise. They wanted to integrate the profitable collectathon aspect of Pokémon into their next major Transformers IP. Gotta catch them all! In order to buy themselves some time developing this new series, they began to officially import the Car Robots toy line and anime series to the West under the new sub-brand Transformers. Robots in Disguise. This one, not this one. Since it had already proved successful with older fans and overseas, it was under this label that the last few cancelled Beast Machines toys saw release. Eventually, the new series, Transformers Armada, was released and even brought back Gary Chalk and David Kay to play Optimus Prime and Megatron, respectively. These two would go on to voice the characters again in both of Armada's pseudo sequels, Transformers Energon and Cybertron. Is it my destiny to fight you forever, Megatron? Out of all of the shows I've done retrospectively, on so far, Beast Machines has easily been the hardest one to sort out my opinions on. Overall, I ended up really enjoying Beast Machines, and I do hope that comes across in these two videos, despite the many criticisms I've leveled against it. Beast Machines is a flawed, but surprisingly engaging and heartfelt show. It deals with subject matter far above the level of your average children's toy marketing vehicle, is gorgeously animated, dark, atmospheric, engrossing, easy to binge, and most of its main criticisms stem directly from the fact that it's just a different experience altogether from its predecessors. Beast Wars this, Rhinox that, Give it a rest already! From the perspective of anybody coming in fresh, there's really very little to complain about in Beast Machines, aside from maybe some repetitive chase scenes. I think if they'd just shown a little more restraint in writing Beast Wars returning characters, Beast Machines could be looked back on today as a classic in the same league as Beast Wars. I understand the desire the series creators had to branch out and try something new, and with the benefit of hindsight, I've come to appreciate the show for what it is, rather than resent it for what I wish it were. I am more proud of Beast Machines than I am any other series I've ever worked on. However, on the flip side, I also completely understand why this series is still such a sore spot for many Transformers and Beast Wars fans. Some love it, some hate it, many like me are stuck in the middle feeling conflicted. Whatever else is said about Beast Machines, however, you can't deny that for better or worse, this show has earned its spot in Transformers history. It'll probably be a little while before I tackle another Transformers series, but when that time eventually comes, the one I'm most interested in are Transformers Animated and Transformers Prime. I've never seen either of them, but I've heard great things. Leave a comment down below letting me know what you think about these two series, and also let me know what other non-Transformers shows you'd like to see me cover in the future. Next up, it's time for the highly anticipated finale of the show that started us on this mainframe retrospective series to begin with. That's right folks, prepare yourselves for the hunt. We're finally taking a look at Reboot Season 4. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, you'd be doing me a huge favor by hitting the like button, subscribing to my channel if you're new, leaving any of your thoughts in the comments down below, and sharing this video with anyone else you think might enjoy it. I've got lots of other videos up on this channel you can check out if you like this. Thanks very much once again for watching, and take care. I think you should... Chill. Chill.